Greetings to the brightest audience in the country. Welcome to Bob and Yurt Live. I'm the pastor of Denver Bible Church. We're going to have Perry from New Mexico back on for the third program in a row to talk about the questions he has after he's gone through the plot, our teaching on the overview of the Bible. First, a couple news items. Thank you for those who clicked on over to our YouTube channel. Yesterday, we put on our website that we were nearing a minor milestone, nearing 1,500 subscribers. And so a number of you guys went over to the Bob and Yurt Live YouTube channel, click to subscribe. And when you do that, and even if you're already a subscriber, YouTube recently changed how they manage new videos. So when you subscribe to a channel like Bob and Yurt Live, there's a bell you will see. You've got to hit the bell or click on the bell so that then you'll receive a notification when there's a new video posted. And we post a new video about once or twice a month, so you're not going to get a lot of clutter in your inbox. So thank you for those who subscribed. We're so excited. And our next milestone is we're approaching 400,000 views. So we'll let you know when we get close. And when we do, then folks in the audience like to help out and help us reach these small milestones. It's fun to share them with you, and it's encouraging because the more people that subscribe and the more people that watch these videos that are all based on a Christian worldview, all based on the gospel, then more people find them. They're more discoverable. That's the way the Internet tends to work. Also, yesterday in Detroit, there was a man that was attempting or at least considering committing suicide by jumping off a bridge, an overpass, onto a highway. And it was so encouraging to see that 13 tractor-trailer trucks, semi-trucks, pulled up under the bridge and lined themselves up so that the man really could hardly fall to his death. Even if he did jump, he'd land on top of a tractor-trailer truck. It was so absolutely wonderful, and it's the opposite, isn't it, of those death advocates who advocate the killing of the innocent, whether it's an abortion or euthanasia or suicide. Of course, God commands against killing the innocent, and this is one of God's enduring commands, do not murder. And as God himself in the Bible paraphrases that elsewhere, Do not kill the innocent. Do not intentionally kill the innocent. And that's why here at Bob and Yurt Live, we advocate for the personhood of the unborn child and against suicide and against, of course, euthanasia and physician-assisted euthanasia. Suicide is inherently destabilizing. It leads to terrorism. Remember the kamikazes of World War II and the Islamic suicide bombers and an epidemic of murder-suicide. And then, of course, when suicide is acceptable, we have more and more children commit suicide. Here, not very far from our BEL studio, there is a high school where, just this week, a student committed suicide. So absolutely devastating. So it's encouraging. Those truck drivers, way to go, guys. For all these years, 27 years on the air, We've had so many truck drivers become longtime listeners of the show, supporters of the show. In fact, I remember one, he and his wife were over-the-road drivers, and they're coming through Denver, and they called up. And so the guy's driving, the wife's sitting next to him in the cab, and he says, Bob, we heard you say that Bill O'Reilly is a liberal. We can't believe it. We're shocked. What do you mean Bill O'Reilly is a liberal? And I said, of course he's a liberal. And he said, well, he can't stand Hillary Clinton. And I said, neither can Bill Clinton. And his wife sitting next to him just burst out laughing. And so that, that was a fun call from a trucker and his wife. And not too long ago, I went down to a local truck stop. 
and interviewed drivers about autonomous trucking and that's coming. And a lot of truck drivers are so concerned about that. And we've warned people, especially folks getting into that industry, there will be tremendous disruption in the trucking industry by 2020. So if you're thinking about becoming a driver, be very wise and think through what you're getting into. Okay, now we have Perry on the line. Okay, what an honor to go back to Clovis, New Mexico. Perry, hey Perry, where in the state is Clovis? Oh, we're, we're seven miles from the uh, Texas border. I'm seven miles in from Texas border, about 100 miles from Amarillo, 100 right. miles from Lubbock. All right. All right. Well, it's a thrill, Perry, to know that you're out there and to continue now with the questions you have about the plot. Can I ask you, have you, you're, you're married, I presume? Yes. So has your wife listened to any of the questions and the discussion? I bet she's listened to 70% of it because uh, she's always with me and I, you know, have it going a lot. Okay. All right. Well, I hope uh, I hope she's encouraged. I know I've been hearing from people in the audience who are so thankful. We often don't take calls. The show is so short that by the time we introduce a topic and a call screener would screen one or two calls, it's about ready to go off the air. So we typically don't take calls, but we're happy to if people call in 1-800-8-N-Y-A-R-T-S, 1-800-836-9278. Okay, so let's continue, Perry. Questions about the Bible. Super. Well, and uh, I so loved in the plot where you pointed out uh, the word miracle really gets overused, maybe even abused. Mm. Um, and I, I kind of think of like, you know, that's so valuable. You know, like uh, we think about an amputee. Have we ever seen an amputee's limb grow out? Well, right. that would be a real miracle. We just don't see yeah, that. Yeah, that would be a miracle, and that doesn't happen. I just heard this week somebody tell us, that missionaries in India said that they saw miracles happening. And I told them, well, interestingly, the Christians there are told that the miracles happen in Oklahoma in the U.S. And here we're told they happen in India and Thailand. And in Thailand, they're told that the miracles happen in England. So the miracles are always happening somewhere else. I, and I, I so hear what you're saying, and it just the teaching made a lot of sense, and I think I was even guilty of uh, misusing the word miracle. But So my, my question is then, I, I grasp there's no real miracles, but what about, does God orchestrate events? Okay, so let's talk a little bit about what you just said first, because that will shock people in the audience who hear that, we teach that God today is not doing miracles. If they go to our website, kgov.com slash miracles, they will see a relatively short article called Miracle Dynamics. It summarizes chapter 10 of the plot. And we show a chart in this article, and it shows how many miracles are described in each of the different sections of the Bible, like the Pentateuch, the first five books, the law in the section of the prophets, in the writings, which is the book of Psalms and Proverbs and so on, then in the four Gospels and in the book of Acts, and curiously, in the epistles, there are no miracles that actually occur that are related. And so why might that be? Everyone we meet in the Gospels who's sick gets healed. No one we meet in the epistles who is sick gets healed. In fact, it's the opposite. So the Bible presents 343 miracles. We list all of them in the book, The Plot, and we talk through every one of them in our audio teaching of The Plot that you got some months back, Perry. And so what we learn is that God shows us in the Bible that the more miracles people see, the more that tends to produce unbelief, and the more hard-hearted they get against him, and even for believers, the weaker their faith gets, not the stronger. Now, there are a few exceptions, but overall, that, it, that characterizes the response to miracles. It tends to foster unbelief, and it weakens faith, because faith comes not by sight, but by hearing the Word of God. And there are very specific reasons for that, 
And Jesus said, the three cities where he did most of his mighty works, and he names them, or they're named in the scriptures, Chorazin, Bethsaida, and Capernaum, those three cities hated him, and the Lord cursed them. Imagine that, the places where Jesus did most of his miracles, you'd think those are the places they believe in him. Not at all. The opposite is what happened. And so they were cursed, and Jesus said, even if a man would rise from the dead, they will not believe, for unless they hear Moses, unless they hear the scriptures, they will not believe. So that's the teaching on miracles that we present at Denver Bible Church on the air at Bob and Yurt Live, and in the plot, our overview of the Bible. Perry, that's not a common Christian teaching. Would you agree with that? Oh, yes. I, that's why I would say I'm guilty of misusing the word miracle too much because of my, my Christian background. Yeah, like if the Cubs win the World Series, it'd be a miracle. Everything's a miracle. A miracle. Ice in the 80s. Yeah, we even make our sandwiches with Miracle Whip. Everything is a miracle, <laughs> but then if everything is a miracle, nothing is a miracle. Right. And when the laws uh, that God created, the laws of physics and chemistry and biology— when they're operating, that's not a miracle, even if something is just awesome. So when God created, he did things, obviously, that were supernatural. But now, as his creation is functioning, the ongoing daily functioning is not miraculous. It's, it puts us in awe and wonder, but a miracle is the superseding of physical or spiritual laws. So when God intervenes and supersedes physical laws, then that's a miracle. So now you're asking a second question. Could you ask that question? Okay. And so, but does God orchestrate events? Okay. Um, for example, it sounds like you and Cheryl were such a great match. <laughs> Was that chance, or did God bring you two together? Yes. You know, so many weddings in so many churches— you know, of all the churches in the world, of all the gin joints in the world, you know, how do we end up here? <laughs> of all, So many churches, they have beautiful weddings. My mom just went to Philadelphia for a wedding this week, and what a beautiful wedding it was. In the churches, many will say that we know that God brought this couple together. That's probably repeated 100,000 times over every year somewhere in the world. Yeah. Tragically, eight months later, two years later, 23 years later, when there's unfaithfulness, when there's domestic abuse, when there's divorce, the same people are not saying the same thing, typically. Mm -hmm. And so there are, let's use marriage as a perfect example to discuss your question. There are two views on this that I think both are in the superstitious side. One is that God decrees everything that happens, include whoever you will marry, has been decreed from eternity past. The other is that God didn't decree it, but he has a person picked out who's the best person for you to marry. Okay, so let's take that second one first. If God has given us freedom to decide who to marry, but he knows who's our best match, he has one person in all the world for us, let's say we don't obey him. Let's say some guy marries the wrong woman, but God had picked out that woman to marry some other guy that hadn't even met her yet. So because this guy marries the wrong woman, that poor slob has his life ruined. Somebody married his wife. Now he has to settle for second best. And before you know it, everyone in the world is marrying the wrong person. Everyone. Within just a few years. So that idea is nonsense. It's superstition and it's nonsense. God has given us faculties, an intellect. He's given us a conscience. He wants us to honor him. To do God's will, to know God's will, means to know his word and to honor him. So if you are honoring him, 
you are doing God's will. That's what God's will is. When we honor him, we don't disobey him. So it's not as though a young person or any person who's looking for a wife or a husband has to figure out this mysterious will of God to make sure they don't marry the wrong person. God has given very basic guidelines in the scripture. You get to know him, you get to know his word, and then you apply the wisdom he's given us to the decisions you make in your life, and then you're in God's will. The other, which is even more superstitious, Perry, is that God has decreed whom everyone will marry, and you cannot marry the wrong person. It's not even possible. You can only marry the person whom God has decreed. So if this is true, in fact, it's taught that everything that happens is decreed, then it's one thing for God to say that he hates divorce, but it's another thing entirely for him to decree millions of divorces every year. And in fact, he seems to like divorce a lot more than marriage. And he seems to like murder a lot more than protecting the innocent. And he seems to like rebellion and wickedness way more than he likes holiness and obedience. Because... Actions speak louder than words. And when a theologian says, well, God decreed this, but he's not the one who did it. There was an intermediary actor, and the intermediary, it was his fault. It wasn't God. Well, if you decree it, you own it. It's not the intermediary actor that bears the primary responsibility. It's the one who decreed it. So we... We address these things in our debates, kgov.com slash debate. You could see my debate with James White that you and I referenced earlier this week, Perry, and that's up to about 30,000 views. We're so thankful it's reaching a lot of people. And so we have just these fascinating studies, one called Chosen, It's Not What You Think, another a seminar on predestination free will, another seminar on open theism. So if God is not going to orchestrate who you marry, then he's, biblically speaking, theologically speaking, then it's very unlikely he's going to orchestrate which coffee shop you go to and which job interview you arrive late at or on time. So when people are trying to get to a meeting and their car breaks down, they say, oh, no. Is God stopping me from going to that meeting? Or they say, oh, maybe the devil's stopping me. So if your theology confuses God with the devil, you got a bad theology. So, Perry, I would say virtually all of that kind of thinking is superstition. It's Christian superstition, kgov.com slash superstition. And instead, we need to get to know God better and get to know his word He does give us peace in our hearts. Let the peace of God rule in your heart, the Bible says. But he does not give us specific verbal knowledge. He doesn't say, make a left-hand turn now. That's like Star Wars in the Jedi. That's not Christian theology. Okay, I got you. All right, well, let me move on to my next question. And you covered that very well, thank you. Um, So... Regarding the uh, rapture and, and tribulation, so step one, uh, the Gentiles, we get raptured out of here. Does the tribulation uh, for those remaining, does that immediately begin right after the Gentiles are gone? I would expect that it does. There is so much in the body of Christ today, so much bias against the rapture, the pre-tribulation rapture, premillennialism. And the primary reason is because of what we mentioned about that acquisition editor from Thomas Nelson Publishing when he rejected the plot, because he said that there's no difference between Israel and the body of Christ. Well, biblically, there's a tremendous difference between Israel, the people of the law, the people of the circumcision, and the body of Christ, which is called the people of the uncircumcision. We attempt, Perry, my goal writing the plot was to make that very clear. And I do you have a sense of, did that come across 
the difference in the Bible between the circumcision and the uncircumcision? Oh, it came across huge, and it's it's so obviously clear in the Bible. I just don't know why me and millions of other Christians haven't grasped that before. That there's yeah, it's just. So two, huge. Two groups of people, and God has a different plan for each group. He loves both groups. Now, and we talked about the main reason why the church doesn't know this, because almost 2,000 years ago they bought into pagan Greek philosophy that God is outside of time and God cannot change, so God cannot even think a new thought. He can't write a new song. He can't design a new flower. So if God, based on people's attributes, divine attributes of the omnis and ims, omniscient, omnipotence, omnipresence, impassable and immutable, if God can't change, if he can't do these things, if he can't interact, then you're not going to understand the Bible because through the entire Bible, God is interacting both within the Godhead and from the Godhead to his creation. And so the things where God is interacting in astounding ways they are downplayed by our theologians, our seminaries, and our Bible colleges. I had a guy this morning at a coffee shop in Arvada. He had a book next to his cup of coffee, and it was titled Church Fathers. So I thought it'd be so fun to chit-chat with him. And I said, sir, could I recommend you do a Google search? If you Google, is God outside of time, you'll see a million web pages, and the number one article is from right here in Arvada, Colorado, from a radio show, Bob and You're at Live. And he said, oh, wow, that's interesting. Yeah, and he said, of course, God is outside of time. And I said, well, that's not what this article says. The article shows from the Bible that God is in time. Do you know, that was about the extent of the conversation. It went on another 15 seconds. And I said, well, and he let me know how strongly he disagreed. And I said, well, have a good day. Do you know he would not smile and he would not say have a good day? He was that Hardcore. angry. He was that angry. So how can Christians learn the dramatic difference in the change in dispensations between the people of the circumcision and the people of the uncircumcision if the God of these covenants is misrepresented? And so that's the main reason why in the New Testament mentions circumcision more than twice as much as the Old Testament, and it's very explicit the differences and when the difference came that believers are no longer supposed to circumcise. Not for cultural reasons, or it's okay if you circumcise for cultural reasons, but God explicitly condemns any believer for circumcising for covenant reasons, because then he's putting himself under the wrong covenant, the covenant of circumcision and the covenant of law. So, Perry, when God gave to Israel his end times program and laid out the end times calendar, the prophetic calendar of what would happen, then Israel rejected their resurrected Messiah. So God temporarily cut off Israel. He turned with Paul to, as the apostle to the Gentiles, and he began the body of Christ. And when the fullness of the body of Christ comes in, Paul writes in Romans, when the fullness of the Gentiles comes in, then God will return to Israel. So the fullness of the Gentiles, when he's done with us, he raptures us so that we meet the Lord in the air, and then he returns to Israel. So the implication is that, yes, as soon as we are raptured, God will be back on his program for Israel, the Great Tribulation, the Second Coming, the Millennial Kingdom, and then the Great White Throne Judgment, and the creation of the new heavens and the new earth. Awesome. Okay, cool. Um. So I, I kind of see myself in the in the near future uh, trying to disciple new believers, you know, take them to basic Christianity. But I kind of think back to when I was, uh, you know, just a young boy. My Sunday school teacher was, you know, was covering John chapter one, and um, 
and, and the Word became flesh. And I remember as a young boy thinking, I got this Word in my hand, the Bible, hard copy. It morphed into Jesus. And I'm, and again, I know adolescent mind. Mm. <laughs> so would I, would I be too flippant if I said something along the lines of, you know, everywhere it says the Word, it really means the Word Jesus. You know, uh, Jesus became flesh, and in the beginning was Jesus. Yeah, so the word, when John, in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 1, and of course the New Testament was written in Greek. So John wrote, in arche en ho logos, kai ho logos, en pros ton theon, kai theos en ho gegenen, if I recall, I'm just going from memory. In the beginning was the logos, the logos, the word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So the Bible is not God. So when the Scriptures say, 13 verses later, that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, it's speaking of Jesus Christ. Obviously, John makes that clear. And so the Bible is not God. And so the Bible can be referred to as the Word of God. But that doesn't mean that wherever you see the Lagos, that it's referring to the written scriptures, because Jesus Christ is called the Lagos, God the Son, the second person of the Trinity, and he is the one who became flesh. And by the way, we have leading theologians like James White who have denied that God the Son has taken on a human nature. He, along with R.C. Sproul Jr., in fact, in the aftermath of my debate with James White, both denied, and this is heretical, and we believe that this is becoming more common among Calvinists, they both denied that God the Son has taken upon himself a human nature. That is a denial of the Incarnation. And they're doing it because, to them, timelessness and immutability are more important. They have a greater commitment to those pagan Greek concepts than they do to the Incarnation which is the central doctrine of Christianity, that God the Son became flesh, became a man in the man Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ is God the Son. It's God the Son who became a man. It's not the man who became a man. It's God the Son who became a man. So, Perry, you need to take it on a verse-by-verse basis. It's usually clear whether the Scriptures are writing about the written Word of God or God the Son. Okay, makes sense. There's our music, and we're out of time. And what an honor to offer to anyone who reads the plot or listens to the teaching series to schedule an hour to talk. So, Perry, we've pretty much used up our hour, but you think you can hang on? We'll talk a little bit more after the show. Oh, gladly. Okay, that'd be great. KGov.com. May God bless you. This is Bob Inyart inviting you to read our manuscript, The Plot, for an overview of the whole Bible. Call us at 800-836-9278. That's 836-9278.